Good morning. It's David again. So nice to see everybody. Um, I just want to continue and, and uh, just share a little more. Have an interesting take on things. A little more in answer to Zane's question number 2B. Uh, his statement at the end of question 2, that Galatians chapter 1 verse 8, says that even if an angel from heaven should preach a gospel contrary to the one the apostles preached, he is to be accursed. All right. Zane and um, all of Reformation Christianity constantly hurls this accusation against the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This, this is something I swallowed myself without any investigation whatsoever. I swallowed myself the accusation that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, they just believed in work salvation. They believed in work salvation. If you believe in that you can be saved by your works, then you're under a divine curse, according to Galatians 1.8. I, uh, I accepted this common accusation that I heard constantly about the evil Mormons, the deceived, the poor deceived Mormons, <laughs> For decades, okay? So, now, now that I have finally seen the light and realized that much of what frustrated me about my evangelical and non-Latter-day Saint Christian experience, that really the brilliant, glorious truths of the Restoration and the... Uh, the prophetic ministry, the restoration prophetic ministry of the prophet Joseph Smith and his successors sorted all this stuff out. Who would have thunk it? Not me. So, so Zane, I, I'm entirely uh, sympathetic to your lack of appreciation for the glorious truths of the restored church, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm, I'm very sympathetic. But... Uh, the title of this video is interesting. It is just have to turn off my phone here. Okay. Uh, the title of this video is Hey Zane, Meet My Cardio Glide. <laughs> Oh, man, many of you are probably wondering what is up with that. It will become clear shortly. But in any case, I, I just have a sacred and holy obligation to try to push the light of the Restoration out to the, the 2.6 billion Christians that think that we're deceived cultists who believe in work salvation, among other heresies, and uh, try to help them to see the, the glorious truths of the Restoration that I looked for everywhere but in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I discovered many aspects of what I'm going to talk about today for myself, and it was incredibly frustrating for me trying to find a place to fit in in um, non-Latter-day Saint Christianity, evangelical Christianity. Very, very hard. I, I couldn't find any place to fit in because I saw things clearly in the Bible that uh, I knew were true, but there wasn't any way to fit it in to that all those 46,000 forms of godliness that deny the power thereof that is non-Latter-day Saint Christianity. So anyway, I wrote some things down here. Often I just speak con completely extemporaneously, as many of you have noticed, but this is a, a bit a bit of a complex topic, but I'm gonna have I'm gonna try and have some fun with it because I don't want to get heavy about this. I, I honestly believe that um, the glorious light of the restoration is going to increase exponentially in the coming years, to the point where the only people that won't see the light of it will be people that are de absolutely determined not to people that are are seeking to hide from the light, but that anybody that has any interest at all in the light of Heavenly Father's truth and glory 
will be drawn. They'll see it and they'll be drawn. So I, I think Zane's going to end up a uh, Mormon. <laughs> I know, Zane, you might scoff at that, but I think you're actually going to end up becoming part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Oh, a wonderful example of the kind of thing that's happening is, is what we see with uh, uh, David Boyce of 52 churches in 52 weeks. You know, he was a, um, a sincere seeker, lifelong Protestant, and decided to go to a different church every week. And he's been doing that for the last three years and started a U YouTube channel on that basis and checked out all kinds of churches. And amazingly, he didn't exclude the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and he visited them, and he couldn't stay away. He had to visit again and visit again. And just last week, he was baptized. Glory to God. So th that's really encouraging when you see sincere seekers. See, my problem is I was a sincere seeker, but I left the Church of Jesus Christ outside of my field of search. And this this has to stop. We have to shine our light bright enough and gloriously enough that the lost people of the world, whether they're lost within non-Latter-day Saint Christianity or without it, that the lost people of the earth will include the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints if they're sincere seekers. That will be part of their field of search because what we have speaks for itself powerfully and prophetically and magnificently if people just give it an honest look with a sincere heart. Okay? So anyway, Galatians' question accuses us essentially of being under a divine curse of people who are trying to be saved by their works, by the works of the law. And as I've explained previously, that's actually talking about keeping the laws of Moses and circumcision. But uh, evangelicals in general and many of the mainline Protestant churches who have, uh, like Lutherans or those that are Calvinist in any way, those that are Presbyterian, they, they would tend to see trying to uh, be saved by anything you do. OK, trying to be saved by anything that you do whatsoever uh, to be work salvation that cuts you off from Christ. And uh, in any case, let me read what I, I say here. Zane and uh, Reformation Christianity constantly hurls this accusation against the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that we're into work salvation and therefore we're severed from Christ. OK. But is it true? They believe against all Bible evidence to the contrary that no one can possibly do anything to earn or become worthy of salvation in any way, that only the imputed righteousness of Christ makes us worthy. And so all who truly believe in Jesus' death and resurrection on their behalf are all worthy on no other basis whatsoever, and all receive Forgiveness and the same eternal life in the same heaven with the same quality of life there on no other basis than their faith in what Jesus Christ did for us through his glorious atonement. And they also believe that to believe anything different than that is damnable heresy that's under the divine curse of Galatians 1.8. Because to try to do anything to be worthy other than believe is another gospel and is work salvation that cuts one off from Christ because you're trying to be justified by law, by what you do or don't do, rather than exclusively by faith in Jesus Christ, completely apart from anything that you do or don't do. So this is, this is I hope I've fairly stated it. And of course, you can't say anything monolithically about the 46,000 non-Latter-day Saint groups and denominations, but a very substantial number, I would say many thousands, even tens of thousands of the different groups and churches that are outside the Latter-day Saints would hold somewhat to what I've just said. Said I think it's, it's fairly stated that, that that's how they would see things. Okay, it's like 
it's the finished work of Christ. And there, there's nothing, there's no way you can add anything to that. All right, whatsoever. Okay. All right. Does this have any basis in reality as laid out clearly in the Bible? And of course, I just, I want to correct any misunderstanding. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints were not based on the Bible. We are also not based on the Book of Mormon. We're not based on Doctrine and Covenants or, or Pearl of Great Price. To us, all that scripture, we believe all four of what we call the standard works are scripture, but what they are is that they are the our the church life of our church is based on the same thing that scripture is based on scripture is fundamentally prophetic revelation it's the record of prophetic revelation from heavenly father through apostles and prophets called and chosen for that purpose that's what scripture is so our life is based on continuing revelation through prophets just as the scriptures came forth from pro prophetic revelation through prophets. We just know that it, it never was supposed to stop and it was restored for us through Joseph Smith and we continue to be guided by prophetic revelation to apostles and prophets that lead us. And of course, they make use of, the, of the, all of the scripture and bring forth from the treasure house of scripture, both new and old, but how to apply that to today Okay, and how to rightly divide that has to be by revelation from the God of heaven through prophets. Okay, you can't figure it out. And the fact that you can't figure it out is proven by the fact that all of Christianity without genuine apostolic and prophetic leadership has been splintering and dividing and disuniting exponentially ever since 18. 20 when joseph smith as a 14 year old went out into that sacred grove because he was so frustrated there were 200 christian groups on the earth then now there's forty six thousand. so that's what's been happening since 1820 which is what 200 years in 200 years it's gone from 200 christian groups and denominations to forty six thousand, with another 1300 or so added each year going forward okay um so Does this have any basis in reality, this idea that there's nothing that we can do that will add anything whatsoever to our salvation, and to believe that is damnable heresy? Does this have any basis in reality as laid out clearly in the Bible? And so, as I said, I'm going by prophetic revelation through prophets, but what the people that accuse us of all this they believe in the bible so i'm i'm defending our faith and practice from the bible and hopefully our understanding of the bible that's been received by prophetic revelation through prophets does god really hate people trying to be worthy and hate anyone trying to earn praise and reward from him based on what they do or don't do are we all just worms and piles of dung covered by the righteousness of Christ and should not expect to try to be more than that? Uh, my, this is my testimony of the whole thing, okay? And I'm no expert. I'm no theologian, whether Latter-day Saint theologian or theologian of any other stripe. But this is just what's in my heart about it. This is my testimony. To me... One of the many glorious truths of the restored gospel is this. The fullness of salvation is only found in the fullness of sanctification. Okay? Now, this is, this is very different, it seems to me, from what non-Latter-day Saint Christians of the evangelical stripe believe. They believe that you're saved and there's there's basically salvation is a one size fits all thing you believed in jesus you you've prayed the sinner's prayer you've asked jesus to come in your heart and be your lord and savior you've made a sincere profession of faith in christ that he died for all your sins was buried and rose again on the third day all right and so now you've given your life to jesus you've prayed the sinner's prayer you've asked jesus into your heart to be your personal lord and savior or whatever particular prayer formula you were presented with, you have sincerely 
given yourself to do that, to ask Jesus into your heart to be your personal Lord and Savior and forgive all your sins. Okay. Your name's written now written in the book of life. You've passed from death unto life. You definitely have your get out of hell free card. You're, you're, there's no chance you can possibly go to hell. You are going to heaven and there's only one and there's really only one degree of heavenly glory. You're going to go there. You're going to be with Jesus and, and heavenly father and the Holy Ghost forever. And of course, those are seen as, as one triune being that is invisible and uh, without form or passion. Or they, you know, I don't want to get into that. That's a whole different topic, their understanding of God. But I think on the ground, most evangelicals really don't think of God. And they just think when they die, they're going to go be with Jesus and God the Father. Okay. And and that's just the and good for them. I mean, that would be nice if it were true. <laughs> okay. But I don't think it is true. Okay. Um, because the fullness of salvation is life on high with Christ Jesus and the Father. And the fullness of salvation is only for those who actually their faith. They walk in the obedience of faith and make steady progress. They're, they're walking in the obedience of faith, and they're actually availing themselves of the full potential that lies in the atonement of Jesus Christ. Okay? So, to me, that's one of the glorious truths of the restored gospel. The fullness of sal salvation is only found in the fullness of sanctification. For evangelicals, they see, okay, well, you're saved, you're going to heaven. And then this whole thing of sanctification, well, of course, you, you want to uh, do your best. Sanctification is like from sanctity, sanctus, meaning to be set apart, to be holy. And my personal experience is very few evangelicals are consumed with the pursuit of holiness. Like, for example, uh, Paul the Apostle was, <laughs> you know. Most of them are quite relaxed and lackadaisical about it because they just, it isn't going to make any difference whatsoever in where you end up. You're going to heaven when you die, whether you pursue sanctification with your whole heart or with 90% effort, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 10% effort, 0% effort, whether you pursue sanctification or not, when you die, your sins are all forgiven. God is going to see you as perfect and holy based on the the shed blood of jesus christ and and uh, when you're going to uh enter into the kingdom of god just like with, with no real difference the person who gives 10 percent effort towards sanctification is going to end up in the same place in the same way and be looked at in the same way by the God of heaven, that the person who devotes themselves entirely to pursuing the goal of it, as it says in Ephesians 4, attaining to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So where's the incentive? Especially since if you're a real zealot for sanctification, you're constantly accused and looked at suspiciously as somebody that seems like you don't really trust in the finished work of Christ, and you're really probably kind of trying to earn your salvation in some way. It's considered suspect to be very zealous when it comes to sanctification, which is why there's whole denominations that exist. Like they're often called holiness churches, that that is their distinctive. The people that belong to holiness churches, they have a very strong distinctive of, you know, we're a holiness church the members of this church, we are pursuing holiness without which no man will see the Lord. And they're considered kind of out there, off the wall. The vast majority of evangelical Christians are in the middle somewhere where they're just kind of like, well, yeah, yeah, it'd be nice to be holy, but I'd rather have a cheeseburger, okay, right now. Uh, I don't mean to make fun of it, but it's it's actually shameful, the the lack of devotion to the pursuit of holiness among the vast majority of Christians that would identify themselves 
as evangelical. And I became this, this became very, very clear to me when I was writing a book back in the 90s. And I did a lot of research about the state of evangelical Christianity. And at that time, there was a research group. He's generally called the George Gallup of the evangelical world, a man by the name of George Barna, the Barna Group, was doing all of this uh, statistical research and surveys, just like George Gallup does, among evangelical, charismatic, and Pentecostal Christians to try to quantify what their values were, what they said they believed, but then what their life actually was on the ground. And uh, in the 90s, the research he did on this was absolutely shocking to many people. But to me, I mean, I this is what I saw. And the research he did was over and over and over again. Like he surveyed evangelical pastors. He surveyed evangelical members. He surveyed all different sorts of groups within evangelical Christianity and compared with statistical analysis what the results were for uh, evangelical Christians compared to the common culture. And what he found was that there was not generally a dime's worth of difference. There was no difference whatsoever between, it's just say, um, watching R-rated movies, uh, premarital sex, uh, porn addiction, hours spent watching screens, internet, TV, whatever. You know, this was before the iPhones came out in 2007, of course. Internet, TV, hours spent on the internet watching TV, pornography addiction, pornography addiction among evangelical pastors, uh, divorce rates, uh, rates of children out of wedlock, just thing after thing after things that actually quantify whether or not being a born-again evangelical Christian made a person's life on the ground, their practical living, their likelihood of divorce, their likelihood of, of uh, just, you could go on and on. In every area, the, the statistics for the evangelical Christians and the evangelical leaders that were surveyed were no different than the degraded common culture of the United States. It wasn't any difference at all, okay? So in any case, let's see, where was I? So the evangelicals believe that sanctification is very much optional. It doesn't make any significant difference in where you end up whether or not you can be with the Father and the Son, uh, there's, there's no, it's not seen that there's any difference in degrees of glory that you might have or the kind of body you might have or, or whether you can be with the Father and the Son, how, uh, whether or not you're welcomed into what you could call the intimate circle. Here's one example of the intimate circle, okay? Jesus Christ says in Revelation chapter 3, he who overcometh, will sit down with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. All right? Okay. Only, according to the very words of Jesus in Revelation chapter 3, only the overcomers are going to be in, in that inner circle, sitting with Heavenly Father and His Son on their glorious thrones, actually sitting with them. Only the overcomers are. So, but there, there's generally no recognition in the evangelical Christianity that I experienced that there's going to be any difference. The, the, the idea that, well, if you're an overcomer, you're going to be on a level of intimacy and oneness with the Father and the Son that you won't be if you don't overcome. No recognition of that. So so where's where's the incentive, especially since... You'll be looked at suspiciously if you take the pursuit of holiness too seriously, unless you're in one of the so-called holiness churches, which have their own unique issues, okay, which I'm not going to get into here. 
So back to this. This is this is what is the basis for these accusations that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that were demonic, demonically deceived people who are trying to save ourselves by our works. All right. So my testimony is that one of the most glorious truths of the restored gospel is that the fullness of salvation is only found in the fullness of sanctification. They are like two sides of the same coin. Sanctification is not optional for those who want the fullness of the salvation that Jesus Christ suffered and overcame death and hell to make possible for us. I'm going to say that again. Sanctification is not optional for those who desire to become elect those who desire and and see this is this is not a weird thing to want to be elect peter speaks specifically in second peter what is it verse 11 i think therefore give all diligence to do what make your calling and election certain okay so it's okay to want to make your calling and election certain. Because if you don't make your calling and election certain, guess what? It won't be certain. Hello, hello, hello. Okay? So, sanctification is not optional for those who want the fullness of the salvation that Jesus Christ suffered and overcame death and hell to make possible for us through his glorious atonement. But this fullness of salvation, the fullness of life on high with the Father and the Son, is only given to those who pay the price, as Paul describes doing in Philippians chapter 3, to grab a hold of that for which God grabbed a hold of him for, or apprehend that for which he had been apprehended of Christ Jesus. See, we've been grabbed essentially, by the gospel. But then we have to grab a hold of what we've been grabbed a hold of for, which is to what? Walk in the obedience of faith. Walk in the works prepared beforehand. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. All right? So, you know, if you don't walk in the works prepared beforehand, that you should walk in them, that that obedience of faith that will allow us to, to attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. If you don't walk in them, you won't get there. Salvation brings us onto a narrow way that leads to the fullness of eternal life. But if you don't walk the narrow way and endure to the end in it, you will not get there. This is the Bible is the the new testament is filled with this okay but it's all denied by this this uh incredible heresy that there's only there's only one level of salvation and and it, it's just through believing in Jesus and there's nothing whatsoever you can do that can add any that can make that salvation any more full or complete. Okay? That is an absolute lie from the pit of hell. All right. Okay. This is not granted to all. This fullness of salvation is not granted to everybody. Based just on the merits of Christ, apart from us making the most of the potential that is inherent in his glorious atonement. It's not optional. It's not like, like I said uh, about even many evangelical Christians say regard baptism. It's just this optional thing off to the side. It has nothing to do with your salvation. Do, do, oh, you want to get baptized? Oh, you want fries with your dinner? Oh, okay, we, we'll, we'll baptize you. But you know, you could have just as easily not gotten fries with your dinner, and it wouldn't make a dime's worth of difference. All right? Okay, this is this is the attitude. And this is the attitude towards trying to attain to some fullness of salvation that if you don't attain to it, you won't get it. That is not even on the radar 
of the vast, vast majority of evangelical Christians. But it should be because their New Testament is filled with this. All right. Without, for starters, it specifically and emphatically says, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. Okay. The atonement of Jesus Christ, there is a sense in which something is given to everybody completely apart from any works. Okay. It gives all a new body completely apart from any faith or effort. The, the, the penalty of sin that all men have committed is the wages of sin is death. And when they die, they are disembodied. They are disembodied spirits. But because of the glorious atonement of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on the resurrection, everybody gets a new body. All right? So that is something everybody gets. But the atonement of Jesus Christ has the potential inherent in it to save to the uttermost all who come unto God in him, by him, by believing in him, which means to trust in, rely on, and cling to him, and trusting in, relying on, and clinging to him, which is what the Greek word that's translated believe actually means. It's not a matter of mental assent only. It's a matter of putting all your weight, seeing Christ displayed before you crucified, his death and resurrection, that your sins crucified him. You put all your weight on that and, and believe in it completely. You trust in, rely on, and cling to Jesus Christ. And then clinging to Jesus Christ as our Savior, the gospel's been preached to us. We've seen Jesus Christ openly displayed before us as crucified by our sins and for our sins. And um, if the preacher of the gospel is has an understanding of the true gospel, we're cut to the heart and we say, what must we do? And it's entirely grace that Heavenly Father would send his word to us through an apostle, through a preacher of the gospel, sent with authority to proclaim the gospel. That's entirely the grace of, of Heavenly Father that that would happen. And that would, they would proclaim the gospel to us in the power of the Holy Spirit is entirely the grace of Heavenly Father sent to us in the power of the Holy Ghost through the messenger, through the preacher, as Paul says in Romans 10, how, how can they hear without a preacher? And that we hear the gospel and we're cut by it in our heart. We're convicted of our sin. The, the Holy Ghost comes upon us and we're convicted of our sin. And then what would be normal is that we would be, well, what shall we do? Okay. And the response, the biblical response is right there in Acts chapter two, as I've said abundantly in my previous videos, Peter's response and that of all the other apostles that day, all day long, at the Feast of Pentecost in Jerusalem, at the very birth of the church and the power of the Holy Ghost was to say, this is what you must do. Repent, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is for you and for your children and for as many as are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, and as many as gladly received his words were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them, that them being verse 42, they continued daily in what? The apostles' teaching and fellowship. They continued steadfastly, which implies enduring to the end in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayer. So at the very beginning, it's entirely grace. The first aspect of, of the glorious atonement is everybody gets a new body. They don't even have to believe to get a new body. They're just going to get one when they're resurrected from the dead. Because since one died for all, therefore all died. He, his death and resurrection for, was for every human being that ever lived. And so having conquered death, everyone is going to get a new body when they're resurrected. Okay, that's entirely grace, all right? Nobody's effort is involved. It's entirely grace that the gospel would come to a person and be proclaimed in the power of the Holy Spirit and that they would be cut to the heart by it. But then immediately what comes into the picture is the necessity 
of what Paul calls at the beginning and end of Romans, the obedience of faith. And of course, you can see this is absolutely necessary in salvation from Hebrews chapter 5, where it speaks of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, in the days of his flesh, he cried out with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Though he was a son, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered and so became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. All right, that's this is the word of God. So where is the obedience necessary? Faith comes to you, you're cut to the heart, convicted of your sin. Well, only the ones that gladly received Peter's words were baptized. And Peter's words were in response to what must we do? You must repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for every single person the Lord our God shall call. Those who gladly received his word were baptized. The ones who did not gladly receive his word were not baptized. They did not enter into salvation. In, they did not get onto that narrow path that leads to life. They did not have their sins remitted. They did not get baptized. They were not added to the death and resurrection of Christ. They did not receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They were not added to that apostolic covenant people that to continue steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and fellowship. And you can see the same thing in the book of Acts where the Ethiopian eunuch He's studying the book of Isaiah, and Philip comes up alongside him, and, and he's invited on board the chariot. And Philip asks him, do you understand what you're reading? He was reading Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant, a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ and his glorious atonement. And the, the Ethiopian eunuch's response is, how can I understand what I'm reading unless I have somebody to guide me? See, that's a humble man. And so... Uh, Philip preached unto him Jesus, preached the gospel unto him, and you can see that integral to the gospel that was preached unto him was the necessity of not just knowing about Christ's sacrifice on his behalf and believing that it happened, but being convicted of his sin and seeing the command, the obedience of faith necessary to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. How do we know that, that Philip told him all that? Because they passed some water, and the Ethiopian eunuch stopped the chariot. He says to Philip, look, here's water. What would hinder me from being baptized? <laughs> Where did he even, how did he even come to know that that was part of the program? Obviously, Philip was saying the same thing to him that was said on the day of Pentecost to everyone, obviously. Okay, and Philip's response is, if you believe with all thy heart, thou mayest. Okay, so the only ones that were baptized are those who gladly received Peter's command to do something, you know. So from the very beginning, from the very beginning, to, just to get on the path of that narrow way that leads to life, what in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints we call the covenant path, you cut a covenant with Heavenly Father in baptism to repent, to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as your constant companion, be added to that covenant people on the foundation of apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone, to remember uh, Christ and to take his name, take Jesus' name upon you and do your best to keep all of his commandments. And so from the very beginning, to even get on the narrow way that leads to life requires the obedience of faith. You can't just, the, the ones, I'm sure there were many there, that their heart was stirred. To some extent, they were convicted of their sin. Okay, there were 3 million people in Jerusalem that day. Only 3,000 gladly received the words, but it could have been 10,000 that said, what must we do, brothers? And then when Peter said, this is what you must do, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, the remission of your sins, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And 
who knows how many thousands were like, well, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let these characters dunk me in front of my family and friends. This is just embarrassing. And they're probably a bunch of drunken fools anyway. And they turned away. They did not believe with all their heart. Like Philip told the Ethiopian eunuch was the fundamental baseline for responding is you have to wholeheartedly surrender to what? The obedience of faith. Okay. So, and then the question is, what follows after that? And as we say in our baptismal covenant, to remember him always, to take his name upon us, and to do our best to keep his commandments out of our love for him, as it specifically says in John chapter 14, verses 15, 21, and 23. All right. So, Believing in him, which means to trust in, rely on, and cling to him, is to walk in the obedience of faith. Like Paul starts the book of Romans in chapter 1, verse 5, and then concludes it in chapter 16, around verse 25, by saying that the whole purpose of his gospel was to bring about not just faith, but to bring about this thing he refers to, he coined the phrase, the, to bring about the obedience of faith among all nations for his namesake. Paul was not interested in bringing about any faith that was not intricately connected to obedience, to bring about the obedience of faith among all nations for his namesake. And the obedience of faith has inherent in it, if we walk in the obedience of faith, the potential of the glorious atonement of Jesus Christ, and this is throughout the scriptures, the potential is for exaltation and becoming just like Jesus, being an overcomer that sits down with him on his throne, just as he overcame and sat down with Heavenly Father in his throne. Being an overcomer is obeying the roadmap to the kingdom to become, that's in Second Peter chapter one verses around verse five to around verse 12, where it describes this process by which we become shares in the divine nature, escape the corruption that's in the world through lust, make our calling election sure, so that we absolutely know this an abundant entrance will be given to us into the glorious kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But if, if you don't do that, there's there's no abundant entrance. Well, what is there? Well, it isn't like, well, if you don't have an abundant entrance, you're going to be tortured forever in the lake of fire. No, there, there's a different degree of heavenly glory that that is what you would be comfortable with because you didn't pay the price for something greater than that. All right. Um, let's see. So. Truly believing him is to walk in the obedience of faith. If you don't walk in the obedience of faith, you are not trusting in, relying on, and clinging to Jesus. You're not loving him. He who has his commandments and keeps them is the one who loves him. Those who walk in the obedience of faith are the ones that are truly believing. They are trusting in, relying on, clinging to him, and endeavoring to keep his commandments. So you can say that Truly believing is walking in the obedience of faith, and the potential for exaltation and becoming like Jesus, if you don't walk in the obedience of faith, is simply not realized. And those who fail to realize this and act on it, they end up in the same position as uh, the, the people talked about in Matthew chapter 721, or a few verses after. Matthew 720 says, not all those who say, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of God. But those who, what, do the will they walk of, of God, those who do the will of my Father in heaven, those who walk in the obedience of faith will inherit the kingdom of God. And these people are shocked. They think they're the select of the elect. They believed in the finished work of Christ. They said, we did this in your name, and did many wonderful works. They were walking around in their own minds, at least, doing all these many wonders in the name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is like, I really don't know you, and you really don't know me. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. 
I never knew you. Okay. So anyway, that, you know, in a few verses later, he says, those who hear my words and don't put them into practice, they're like people who are building on sand. They think they've got a great place there. But when it's tested, it's found to all fall apart. Everything they think they had proves to be an illusion, just like in the verses before. Okay? So, where are we here? So, John 1, 12, when I first gave my life to Jesus at the age of 21, June 10th, 1976, see if a real evangelical can tell you the day that they prayed the sinner's prayer and gave their life to Jesus. I gave, I prayed the sinner's prayer and gave my life to Jesus at the age of 21 in June 10th, 1976. And as I've said before, four days later, I was reading Romans and I came back. I said, why didn't you baptize me? And they took me down and dunked me in Capitol Lake, but I just got wet. Okay. John, when I was reading that Bible, though, and I read chapter 1, verse 12 of John, I got so excited. Because it said in verse 11 that Jesus came unto his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even as many as believe in his name, who are born not of the flesh, nor of the will of, of, of nor of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Okay. Um, and I found that incredibly exciting. So when you actually receive Jesus, you receive the power to become a son of God. You, you, that doesn't mean you're automatically a son of God. Just because you have the power to become something, there's a transition that needs to happen. Becoming demands transition, okay? You have to make use of the power that he gives you to actually become a son of God. It's not automatic. It's This, this stuff, it, like... You're not going to be automatically be an overcomer, Zane, unless you overcome. You won't automatically attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ unless you attain to it. Like Paul says in Philippians 3, he says, he says that uh, he wanted to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, if by any means he might attain to the resurrection of the dead not that he'd already attained or was already perfected but he pressed on that he might lay a hold of that for which christ jesus had laid a hold of him so paul was only going to attain to the resurrection of the dead if he attained to it he had to attain to it do you understand what i'm saying all right so uh like it says in um as I said in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 to 11, it says that if we add to our faith virtue and virtue knowledge and knowledge brotherly kindness and brotherly kindness love, that if these things be innocent abound, they'll make us that we would be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he who lacks these things is blind and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Therefore, let us give all diligence to what? Make our calling and election sure. For if we do these things, we will never stumble. And so an abundant entrance will be ministered to us into the kingdom of our everlasting God and Savior. Okay? So if you do not do that, if you don't make your calling and election sure, by grabbing a hold of the great and precious promises that allow you to, to attain, to become a share in the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world through lust, then, and then add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. If you don't do that, what do you fall? You fall in the category of someone who lacks these thing and is, things and is blind and has forgotten you were purged from your old, old sins. And no abundant entrance will be ministered to you. So apparently there's going to be people, if, if the scripture actually is true, which of course evangelicals believe, that's their only rule of faith and practice, there's going to be people who have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God and people that don't. 
That doesn't mean they're going to hell. It just means that they aren't. their entrance will not be abundant. There's going to be people that attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, and most won't be attaining to that. There's people who are going to be conformed to the image of Christ and people that won't be conformed to the image of Christ. There's people that, uh, as it says, that in order to uh, sit down with him on his, his throne, we have to overcome in order to sit down with him on his throne, just as he overcame and sat down with his father on his throne. The people that don't overcome are not going to sit there. I mean, so, so there, there's so clearly differences in where people end up in terms of heavenly glory. And of course, without, you know, the, the, the baseline promise is it's a negative promise and a positive promise. If you're holy, you'll see you'll see the Lord. You'll be seated with Heavenly Father and His Son. If without holiness, no one will see the Lord. I mean, is that true or not? Okay. So this is this is I entitled this. Hey Zane, meet my cardio glide. Okay. <laughs> All righty then. Here we go. Meet my cardio glide. This is an exercise machine that I bought a month and a half ago so I could get in top physical condition, okay? Because I, I want to be uh, married. I'd really like to have a wife, but I want to be, if I'm going to have a wife, I want to be like absolutely fit as a fiddle. I want to be like, you know, trim, taut, and terrific, <laughs> okay? And I don't think that's just vanity. I'm sure there's some vanity involved. But it's just love, man. If 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 you want to have a wife, uh, you want to be fit and healthy and and uh, vigorous for her, uh, and you hope she'll be the same for you, right? Okay, so this was my plan. Here's my plan. Meet my cardio glide. Here we go. See? Let's see. Where is it? There we go. There's the cardio glide. That's my... Cardio Glide exercise machine, full body, low impact exerciser. All right. Okay. And at the end of this video, I'm going to show you a video that inspired me to get this thing. I say that laughingly, but that's my Cardio Glide. Okay. And I bought this. This is actually, it's a wonderful exercise machine. And the simple reality, if, if I just make full use of it, Actually, if I had started making full use of this thing a month and a half ago, Zane, I'd look like a different person. I mean, I, I would be well on my way to being trim, taut, and terrific, okay? I had a big plan. I got this cardio glide a month and a half ago. I made room for it in my living room. You know what it's been? I set my laptop on this puppy to make my videos. OK, I had this incredibly good plan. OK, big plan. I was going to be on this thing full bore doing the it's it's like a combination bicycle and rowing machine that exercises every muscle in your body without any jolting or impact, which is exactly what I need. And I've used these before. They're great if you make full use of them. So the big plan was uh, a a very serious uh, cardio glide session of a half an hour every morning and every evening, every day, okay? I have yet to do it once, <laughs> okay? Now, I know all, it, all analogies are very imperfect, and this one is no exception, but still, parables are useful, okay? John 1, 12, as many as received him, he gives power to become sons of God. But you still have to make use of the power he gives you. You have to daily avail yourself of the incredible power that is there in, in the power of the spirit that maketh holy, in the power of the glorious atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of his death and resurrection, to die to the old man and put off the old man and rise with him in newness of life. What's it say in Romans 6? This is the power that is in the atonement if you make use of it, 
okay? It's a, uh, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Don't you know as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we've been joined together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin would be done away with, that we would no longer be its slave, for whoever has died has been freed from sin. And if we died with him, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. And then I just love the next verse. He says, in the same way, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And therefore he says, on that basis, you live your life on a daily basis, yielding your members as instruments of righteousness to God, as servants of God, and saying no, not yielding your members any longer as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. For, you know, you're a slave of whatever master you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Okay, and then he goes on and he gets to the end of chapter six, and this is how he sums it up. He says, therefore, he says, this is what you have to do. Continually choose, use your moral agency on the basis of knowing that you're dead indeed to sin, but now you're alive unto God in Christ Jesus, that you consistently, he says, therefore, having been set free from sin and having become a slave of God, the fruit of this is holiness and the end result is everlasting life for the wages of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life through jesus christ our lord so so this is this is the glorious potential that is in the atonement of jesus christ is to die with him to sin rise with him to newness of life consistently yield our members as instruments of righteousness unto holiness to do the consistently do the will of God, and then we can say in the last verse, having been set free from sin and having become a slave of God, the fruit of this is holiness, and the end is everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For those who actually do what he says you have to do in Romans 6, you know, it's, it's not just, oh, I asked Jesus in my heart, in june 10th 1976 and now i'm in like flynn that's not what it says man that's not what the new testament says and it's not what paul teaches so anyway that's the potential that's like the cardio glide machine if you actually jump on the atonement morning noon and night and exercise your faith in the atonement to actually put off the old man and put on the new man and walk in the obedience of faith, guess what? You're going to become like Jesus. You're going to be an overcomer. You're going to attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You're going to live as a share in the divine nature and completely escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. You will sit down. You will become someone who in your character is actually suited to be in the presence of a holy God whose eyes are 10,000 times brighter than the sun because you will become somebody that has nothing to hide, okay? If you don't become somebody who in your character and in your soul has nothing to hide, the last place in the entire universe that you would want to be is in the presence of the Father and the Son. You will just draw back in shame and run for the exits. Okay, this is just the reality of it, man. It's just the reality of it. So, how does what's this got to do with the cardio glide? Okay, I had I got my cardio glide. Hooray! I gave my life to Jesus. Big plan, half hour every morning and every evening. Now, a month and a half later, I'm no more fit than I was when I got it. Why? The potential is in the machine for me to be gloriously fit. I, I went forward at the at the church service when they preached the glories of the cardio glide. 
I, I went ahead. I, I bought the cardio glide. I went forward and prayed the cardio glide prayer that I was going to exercise every morning and evening. I got my instruction manual and my cardio glide and I took it home. All right. When is the fitness of those people in that commercial that I watched, when's it going to be imputed to me? What gives? It's not going to be imputed to me. I mean, the atonement is different in the sense that by the glorious atonement of Jesus Christ, if we repent and are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins, our sins are remitted and we're washed clean, and then we receive the regeneration and the glorious renewal of the Holy Ghost, the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost that's given unto us, and then we are added to a covenant and apostolic people. If we're fortunate enough to understand the need for that and have found the only place on earth where, where it exists, which is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So this, as I said, all analogies are very imperfect. But all I'm saying is that I can, I can have the atonement, and if I don't make full use of the atonement of Jesus Christ and the glorious gift of the Holy Ghost— I'm not going to become someone that is going to experience the fullness of salvation. I will experience something far less. I will experience something. I will reap exactly what I sow. I will get out of the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gift of the Holy Ghost and this amazing salvation. You know, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? I will get out of it what I put into it. This is just the reality of things, okay? So the potential is in that cardio glide for me to be glorious fit, gloriously fit. The atonement is like my cardio glide. I have to make full use of Jesus' glorious sacrifice to get the full benefit from it. This is seen throughout the entire New Testament and is also just common sense. As we can see from Romans 6, it's very instructive. The same book of Romans that people who misinterpret the Apostle Paul's writings claim teaches that there's, there's a righteousness that's imputed to us that will take us to the highest degree of heavenly glory completely apart from us doing anything whatsoever. And to, do, to think you have to do anything whatsoever is what disqualifies you. This is just, uh, you know, that same... Uh, that's the book of Romans that Romans 6 is in, that I just described, okay? And let's see what else it says in Romans here. He says here, this is uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 5. Paul says, those who want eternal life According to Paul in Romans chapter 2, they must believe in Jesus, trust in, rely, and cling to him, but also be those, and these are his words, who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life, okay? When they're judged according to their works, they're going to receive full, eternal life, the fullness of it, as a result of seeking for glory, honor, and immortality. This is the verses, chapter uh, 2, verse 5 to 11. After thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man that doeth evil. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, for there is no respect of persons with God. So to sit down with him on his throne, one must overcome as he did, or you will not be with the Father and the Son on their thrones. Zane. To be worthy. To be his disciple, we have to pay the cost of discipleship, as Jesus lays out throughout the Gospels, which essentially is your entire life, entire consecration. 
He who loves his life will lose it, but he who loses my life, his life for my sake will find it. You know, if any man would be my disciple, let him deny his very self and pick up his cross daily and follow after me. He who loves his life will lose it, but he who loses my his life for my sake will find it. To be worthy of an abundant entrance into the everlasting of king, the kingdom of God, one must follow the roadmap to the kingdom. Okay, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. Okay, he's given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Why do we need to do anything? Well, listen to what he says. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Boy, that, that sounds a lot like works, doesn't it? Do you know what? Try adding those things to your life. I'm telling you what, it's work. Breaking bad habits and starting new ones is the hardest work on earth. But this is what we're commanded to do, and it's not optional, okay? If we want to become shares in the divine nature and escape the corruption that's in the world through lust and attain to an abundant entrance of the glorious kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we have to do this stuff. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you don't make your calling election sure by using these great and precious promises and adding what we're instructed to add to them to make one's calling and election sure, no abundant entrance will be ministered to you. And your calling and election is not only not sure, it's extremely unlikely. Almost certainly, you're not going to have any abundant entrance whatsoever into the glorious kingdom of Jesus Christ. To be worthy, to hit the mark of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, you have to actually press towards it. I mean, listen, listen to these verses from Philippians 3. Verse 7, what things were gained to me, these count I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Okay, now if you read the previous verses in Philippians 3 and the end of Philippians chapter 2, the righteousness which is of the law he's talking about is the law of Moses and circumcision. That's crystal clear. Because he now goes on to talk about all the things that he needs to do to attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. All right? Evangelicals, almost most of, the vast majority of them, want to stop okay they want to stop at verse 9 to be found in christ not having their own righteousness which is of the law the law of moses and circumcision but that which is through faith in christ the righteousness which is of god by faith they stop there but look that's where paul starts he goes on he says that i may he goes on the righteousness which is of God by faith has brought him onto the narrow way that leads to the fullness of eternal life. He has not 
there yet. As you can see, he's on a narrow path headed towards the fullness of joy and the fullness of eternal life in Christ Jesus. But this is the pathway to get there, just like we saw in 2 Peter. That's a pathway. It's a roadmap to the kingdom. Add to your faith this and this and this and this and this and this by virtue of these great and precious promises, giving all diligence that they be in us and abound. And then we can be certain that our calling election is sure and that an abundant entrance will be ministered to us into the everlasting kingdom. It's a roadmap. It's a covenant path, just like uh, Paul talks about in Ephesians 2. You know, that by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. It brings you, without any, without any works of your own, onto a narrow way that leads to life. That's to start to be described in the very next verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works that God has prepared beforehand, that we should what? walk in them. There's a narrow and difficult way that leads to the fullness of eternal life. So this is what follows. So he's found not having his own righteousness, but that which is through faith in Christ. What does he do now? Oh, he just doesn't do anything because he's just, he's attained, man. He has the righteousness of Christ. What's left for him to do? Nothing, according to the evangelicals. According to the evangelicals, the vast majority of them, he's, he's found in Christ not having any righteousness of his own, but that which is the right, righteousness which is from God by faith, the righteousness of Christ which is from God by faith. He, he just needs to wait to go to glory. That's all he needs to do, right? No, not right. Exact opposite. Verse 10, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Why would he want to know Christ in the fellowship of his sufferings? Well, he wrote in Romans 8 that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. On what condition? If so, be we suffer with him that we might be glorified with him. Paul knows that there's a potential for him to receive by the power of Jesus Christ, incredible atonement on his behalf, that the Heavenly Father gave everything to his Son. Christ is the inheritor of everything the Father hath, and that if he suffers with Christ, that he will be a joint heir with Christ, and everything that the Father hath will also be his on the condition that he suffers with Christ, that he might be glorified with him. It's conditional. And Paul hadn't attained to that yet. This is what he says. Verse 10, I, that I might know him. Now, now that he's justified through faith in Christ, he says, I want to press on to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. What is he talking about? He's talking about a resurrection that he had no confidence he had already attained to. Almost certainly what he's speaking about is the first resurrection that you can read about in Revelation chapter 21, where it says, blessed and holy are they that have part in the first resurrection. On them, the second death will have no power, but they will be priests of God in Christ and reign with him for a thousand years. You're talking about the elect who are resurrected, not at the end of the millennium, but at the beginning of the millennium, and they rule and reign on the earth and restore the earth under the reign of Jesus Christ from Jerusalem. And this is something that has to be attained to. You're not automatically. Just because, you, just because I prayed the sinner's prayer on June 10th, 1976, or even just because I was baptized by proper priesthood authority on March 20th, 2023. That doesn't automatically mean I am going to attain to the first resurrection and rule and reign with Jesus Christ on the earth during the thousand-year millennial reign. But Paul specifically says, 
He wants to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. See, you can hardly find my experience is you can hardly find in an evangelical, in evangelical, charismatic, and Pentecostal Christianity that takes this seriously at all, that actually recognizes having been found in Christ, not having his own righteousness, but that which is through faith in Christ. The teaching they receive and the formation that they receive in their churches is that you're all set. You're going to glory. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. There's no need to do any of this stuff Paul talks. Well, you can. I mean, it's okay to pursue sanctification, but it isn't going to make a dime's worth of difference in terms of where you end up or the glory you're going to receive when you get there, you know, or or the, the degree of intimacy or oneness with the Father and the Son, your level of responsibility or glory. And there's no understanding at all of different levels of heavenly realms that understanding this stuff makes clear is absolutely necessary. People are not going to be ready unless they actually attain to something close, not just in this life, but in the spirit world when they leave the body and then during the millennial reign. If by the end of the millennial reign, they've still got things to hide, they're not going to be with the Father and the Son. It's not going to happen, man. Okay? Therefore, let us, as many as would be perfect, he says, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. And then he goes on to say something very interesting. He says, for many walk as whom I've told you often and now tell you, even weeping that they're enemies of the cross of Christ. All right. And of course, these people he's speaking of, they, they think they're fine. But they're not pressing towards the mark of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. They're living to gratify their flesh. All right? So those who want eternal life in its fullness, according to Paul in Romans 2, they must believe in Jesus, but also be those who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. And then when they're judged according to their works, they will receive eternal life, the fullness of it, as a result of seeking after it. To sit down with him on his throne, we must overcome as he did, or we will not be with the Father and the Son on their thrones. Okay, I'm about to wrap this up, but in my view, a huge part of the apostasy of the first church towards the end of the first century, when John wrote 1 John, is right there in 1 John 3 for all to see. He warns. Let no man deceive you, precisely because such men were deceiving them into imagining that God saw them as righteous, just based on the imputed righteousness of Christ, apart from them making use of the power of his atonement and the spirit that maketh holy to actually become saints who actually were righteous in reality and in the practice of their daily lives. The idea that to labor with patient continuance in well-doing was not necessary, but was actually trying to be saved by your works. 
This idea destroyed the first church, in my opinion. You don't love him if you don't keep his commandments. You won't inherit the kingdom of God if you don't become a person who, in your character, have become someone who does the will of God. The foundation of God stands sure, and its seal is, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. In my experience in evangelical Christianity, very few even seriously aim at holiness. Because what difference will it make? The holy and the unholy who have believed in Jesus supposedly all have the same eternal destiny based on nothing other than the finished work of Christ. All are thought to end up in the same place, and all are supposedly seen as perfect and holy, based exclusively by God. Heavenly Father, he sees everybody, whether they've pursued holiness and attained it, or haven't pursued it at all, or they're somewhere in the middle. He sees them all as, as perfect and holy as Jesus. This is, this is the idea that's commonly told to people, all right? When they, when they get to the pearly gates... God looks at them, and all he sees is the holiness of Christ. And they're welcomed into the presence of the Father and the Son based only on that. Okay? Those people, unless they, in their character and in their soul, they have nothing to hide, and they're, they're transparent and clean and holy. They, are, they will run screaming from the presence of the Father and the Son. That's the reality of it. All are thought to end up in the same place and seen as perfect and holy, based exclusively on what Jesus did, regardless of whether they were truly enemies of the cross of Christ or truly denied themselves and picked up their cross and followed Jesus. And the power to actually do that, the power of the Spirit that maketh holy, is not even there in non-Latter-day Saint Christianity anyway. So, of course, very few even try to be holy. There's no Spirit. Holy Ghost, or true priesthood, or true apostolic and prophetic covenant path to get there anyway. So why try? All the iniquity of one's soul is supposedly completely overlooked and miraculously transformed into the very holiness of Jesus in the twinkling of an eye, being given the very character of Christ and his purity soul, purity of soul, as people pass through the pearly gates, which begs the question, then why does the Apostle John, who knew Jesus more intimately than any other human being, other than perhaps his mother, say this? This is from 1 John chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 2, 3, 7, 8, 9, 10. It's just six verses here, okay? Beloved, now are we sons of God, and it hath not yet appeared what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he, even as Jesus is pure. So if we have a right understanding, our hearts are set. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, just as Jesus is pure. Little children, let no man deceive you. Why, why, would, why would John say that? The only reason John would exhort them and admonish them to not be deceived is because apostate false apostles and false teachers were coming in and deceiving the saints in this very thing that John warns against. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he, Jesus, is righteous. So, little children, let no one deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as Jesus is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, and that this is, in, in the Greek, this is not speaking about a one-time thing, but a practice. You know, he that is born of God does not allow himself to continue to do things that he knows are against God. Okay? 
For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So, in any case, there you go. So the, the exhortation of the Apostle John is very pointedly that little children let no one, no one deceive you. He that practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who keeps on sinning is of the devil, for the devil was a sinner from the beginning. So this, this ties in, of course, with Romans 6. What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We died to sin. How can we continue to live in it any longer? And of course, you say this around the vast majority. They're like, are you saying you don't sin? Are you saying you don't? You think you're perfect. You believe in, in uh, what, what is it? Um, Christian perfectionism. Well, you know what? Ultimately, the goal is to attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is the goal. of This is the fullness of the salvation that Jesus died for, that he would be the firstborn of many brethren that are just like him, who have become sharers in the divine nature and attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I'm not there yet, I frankly admit. I'm on a pathway there, though. Are you? Are you on a genuine covenant pathway on the foundation of apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone and an apostolically and prophetically outlined standard of truth that if you trust in it, you can make steady line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little progress towards becoming a little bit more like Jesus today and then a little bit more like Jesus tomorrow. And you know what? A journey of a of a of five thousand miles starts with a single step. But if you keep taking single steps all through the rest of your mortality, and then in the spirit world, once you go into the spirit world, and then when you're resurrected, hopefully at the beginning of the millennium, through the thousand years of the money, you know what? You'll get there. Because it isn't normal for people who are, what does Paul say in um, Galatians chapter 5? Walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the sinful nature. There, There is the possibility of walking in the spirit and not fulfilling the desires of the sinful nature. And anybody that wants to deny that is is basically denying the possibility of sanctification which is really jesus did not die just to save us he died to save us and give us a pathway towards actually becoming just like him and attaining to the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ and becoming partakers of the divine nature and completely escaping that is in the world through lust and of course all of this Every single thing I've talked about is only possible because of the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. It, you know, it's it's like the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, not to be trite, but it's the only real exercise machine that can get you there. There is nothing else that can get us there. It's only trusting in what Jesus did for me and in the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost and walking in that pathway of the obedience of faith that he provided for me. He, he said, the way is very narrow and difficult that leads to life and few there be that find it. But thank God I found it. Now I'm on it. Am I going to walk on it steadily to the end? Okay. It's like um, everything, Every when we get there, just like when they put the capstone on the temple, the final call was grace, grace to it. It's only by the mercy and grace and the power of God and the spirit of holiness made available through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that we can pursue holiness without which no man can see the Lord and have very real lively hope of pursuing it successfully. But the idea that even just because we can only do it by the grace of Christ does not mean that God is that that there's there's something wrong with heavenly father those who honor him he will honor those who glorify him he will glorify those who make the most use 
of the glorious sacrifice that he gave in giving his only son, Jesus, to die for us, and that, that Jesus gave in his incredible obedience of faith to walk that path for us. It honors Heavenly Father that we would make full use of that. And the, the Word of God specifically says, Heavenly Father's heart is whoever honors him, he will honor. So there's nothing wrong with wanting to uh, be an overcomer that hears those blessed words. I mean, when I first read the Bible 48 years ago, when I was 21 years old, when I first read the Bible, when I was 21 years old, and I heard that if I really found the, the right path forward and was a good and faithful servant, that I could hear those blessed words when I stood before Jesus Christ, well done, good and faithful servant, welcome into the joy of your master. And I was like, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I want. And I set my heart to pursue that, and I haven't stopped pursuing it, even for a day. You know, I'm very faulty in my moments, and th the key is we have to be faithful with every moment. But I have done my best to set my heart every day to seek first the kingdom and pursue that holiness without which no man will see the Lord. I had no foundation to do it from, and I had no understanding of the pathway forward. I was lost in the thickets of forms, 46,000 forms of godliness that deny the power thereof. But I'm not, I, I find I got my feet on solid ground, man. He brought me out of the pit, out of the miry clay, setting my feet on a rock, making my footsteps firm. Praise to you, a new song in my mouth. Praise to you, my rock and redeemer. Praise to you, many will see and fear and put their trust in you so anyway this is why the evangelicals accuse us of work salvation because we believe that the fullness of the salvation jesus christ died to give us the fullness of life on high in christ jesus seated with the father and the son on their thrones ruling and reigning with them suffering with him that we might be glorified together and becoming a joint heir with Christ in all the fullness that implies everything that the Father hath being given to us just as he gave it to his son Jesus. I mean, gosh, attaining to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, being come conformed to the image of Christ, being the many brethren that he's the firstborn of, and setting the whole created universe free, as it says in Romans 8, from its bondage to corruption and bringing it all into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. This is not going to be for spiritual slackers. This is for the elect. This is for those that make their calling and election sure and make full use of the incredible grace and glory and mercy and power made available to us through the atonement of Jesus Christ. And so we know that the fullness of salvation is the fullness of sanctification. And without the fullness of sanctification, you will not get to the fullness of salvation. And it's all by grace through faith in what Jesus did for us through his glorious atonement. But just like the cardioglide, the incredible, just earth, universe-shaking potential of the atonement of Jesus Christ is only efficacious for us to the extent that we make full use of it, as Paul so pointedly said. I press on that I might apprehend that for which I have been apprehended of Christ Jesus. Not that I've already apprehended, but I, I press on toward the measure, to, to attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I press on toward the upward call of, of God the glorious prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, as many as would be perfect must have this mind. Okay, this is all right there in Philippians 3. Paul's writings are filled with this. And so this is, this is not the heretical work salvation spoken of in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. And, you know, this, this, uh, this constant 
decades, even almost two century long accusation in this regard is is tiresome. It's just it's pathetic because what the restored faith is of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints is the most profoundly biblical understanding of salvation and sanctification and the truest to what's in the New Testament of any faith on earth. And no, none of the other 46,000, the non-Latter-day Saint Christian groups and churches are, are even in the same ballpark, man. They, none of them are even in the same ballpark with us. So anyway, come home. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, this is, this is something that cardioglide this let let's pray let's let, let's say a prayer before i talk more about the cardio line. heavenly father we're just so thankful uh and i i know um uh, many of the saints are probably a bit worn out by this i know i'm worn out about it it's just hard to just have to keep defending things that are so obviously true but we just ask that you just help us and i especially ask that any people out there in the world that would benefit from uh, this video, that it would reach them, that we could work together to push the light of the restoration out to the whole world, and that you would just have mercy and grace on that effort. And I just ask this in the name of thy beloved son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, I think I think we'll just stop there. Much love to all of you and uh we'll see you again soon.